Welcome to Election Adda. Uh, the last three days have been all about the last uh, and final phase of polling and the big exit polls uh, that hit the news on Sunday night. Lots of big questions to be asked. Are these in fact uh, the truth? Uh, polls, exit polls always raise questions in the minds of most who do statistics and run surveys that are not exit polls. Uh, and uh, of course, when you get exit polls like the ones we got on Sunday night, which seem to be ranging from 360 to 240 for, uh, for, 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 for the BJP and the opposition arguing that this is all gossip, uh, and nothing that we should believe and Thursday the 23rd is going to be Judgment Day. How do we make sense of these exit polls? Uh, and what does this mean? Both in terms of how to interpret what happens day after tomorrow on the final day of counting that will bring an end to this long marathon election. But also more importantly going forward, what does this mean for the entire industry of polling? And how should we as political scientists and observers of Indian politics and Indian society interpret the process of polling and what polling and forecasting uh, throws up for us? These are some of the big questions that we are going to ask our two in-house pollsters and uh, election gurus uh, who are here with us today, Rahul Varma and Nilanjan Sarkar, uh, who are going to help demystify the complex process of polling, give us a sense of how to interpret the polls uh, and the poll of polls that have been hitting news channels since Sunday night and have been now the main topic of conversation in small groups and large. Uh, and will continue all the way till Thursday morning when we finally get results, but also engage with us in a more deeper discussion on some of the larger questions around polling um, and how one can use data that emerges from polls to better understand shifts in Indian politics and Indian society. So, Neil and, uh, so, and Rahul, uh, let me begin first by posing more or less the same question, I think, to both of you, which is, what should be our key takeaways? We seem to have, uh, like I said, a fair amount of variation. Uh, although uh, my sense is, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, that despite the variation, we are getting a clear trend that uh, it is going to be a BJP single party. Uh, the, the, the largest majority uh, party is going to be the BJP, uh, not necessarily the majority party. Um, but there's also a fair amount of variation in what are the three critical states. And we've kind of known this yeah. all along through this election. West Bengal, Odisha, and most importantly, Uttar Pradesh. To me, Uttar Pradesh is particularly intriguing because the numbers are ranging from 22 to 68, uh, and everything that we know about the, the implications of, uh, of the Mahagat Bandhan on what that would do for voting seem to suggest that uh, you would see a lot of shifts uh, between what the BJP got in 2014 and what they might well get in 2019. So, lots of variation happening. What explains this variation firstly and uh, how much will this variation impact uh, what happens uh, in the final result? Okay. Uh, so, the, so what you started with uh, about election polling and uh, election light forecasting and uh, statistician value of it, you are absolutely right. Uh, there is a saying that every election night, for, when election night forecasting happens, statistics dies a bit. <laughs> so every five years, statistics die. No, so I mean, there's a lies, lies in statistics. Yeah. There's a lies, lies in exit polls. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. But you're absolutely right. So they, so polls on Sunday basically pointed to a convergence, and the convergence is that NDA is going to be the front runner. Uh, BJP is going to be the front runner. So there is no sort of confusion about that in the exit polls. But what you suggested is about the wide variation. Mm -hmm. You have exit polls forecasting from 265 seats for the NDA to 365 seats for the NDA, which is a range of 100 seats, right? And the second variation among these exit polls is basically not just in critical states, but in many, many states, both in terms of votes as well as in terms of seats. Even in terms of vote, the lowest vote share assigned to NDA is 38% which is basically roughly what they had in 2014 and the highest is around 48.5 yeah. which is basically even higher than the Raji Trapindra Gandhi wave in 1984. Okay, but sorry, I'm so, going to stop you here for a quick second uh, because for those in the, uh, who are watching who don't fully understand 
uh, how the process of polling works. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you go from polling, forecasting to determining seat share? So how do we go from getting a sense of the vote share to determining the actual seat count? So, so uh, most of the polls which came on Sunday are exit polls. Mm -hmm. uh, so none of them are post poll in that sense that you are going to voters home and then conducting surveys. No, no, sorry. So now explain the difference. Because so, the average person, when they think of an exit poll, you assume that you've spoken to somebody who's cast their vote and they will tell you. So 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 exit polls are basically conducted outside the polling booth. You are exiting the polling right. booth and Correct. then there are other kinds of surveys where you call people on their mobile phones or you basically go to voters' home after the vote has been casted, but you do this survey before the counting begins, right? right? So CSDS surveys are generally post poll surveys in nature. Whereas right. most other polling agencies either do exit polls or they do telephonic surveys. Now, the sad or unfortunate part is that exit polls, uh, pollsters are not transparent about this. Uh, we can make a guess that who has done a telephonic survey or who has done this uh, on the ground, but we surely don't know. Uh, the, uh, so, so that's about the method. The second part about, so when you do polls, you ask people who, who have they voted for, or uh, we have figured out that some pollsters don't ask, don't even ask this question, but they generally go for who have you supported. So voted and supported are two very different exactly. terms. Yeah. Uh, but what happens, so pollsters have like two different methods. One, you sample some constituencies, get the vote shares for those co based on those constituencies and make a national level estimate for votes and then convert it into seats. The other method which seems to have become very popular in 2019 and few years back is that you poll in all constituencies and you are not making an estimate based on sample constituencies but you are basically counting the number of seats with like a particular party is well. So these are the two broad methods. Uh, so I mean what I would say about these two methods, I think just expanding upon that, is that they each have their strengths and they each have their weaknesses. So if we are to look at those kinds of polls that go to every constituency. So I'm going to name an agency here, the Access Poll, which a lot of people have been talking about, interviewed more than 7 lakh voters. Now that's a very impressive number. But sorry, they did this uh, uh, by going to the polling booth or they did this via the phone? Or uh, don't know? They did it uh, on face-to-face -face survey is, is the claim. Okay. Um, it's not clear to me whether they did it at the polling booth or whether they did it at people's homes. Mm -hmm. But the larger challenge that you face when you are targeting that many voters in such a short period of time is that it's essentially a lightning strike. So your representativeness of the samples, particularly in a particular constituency, is going to go way up. Now let me tell you what that means. What it means is that even though I'm trying to do a very good job of sampling a constituency, if I essentially have 24 to 48 hours to get everyone, uh, imagine that a constituency, 20% of the population is Muslim, 30% of the population is Dalit, and 50% of the population is not neither of those two communities. Now when I go quickly, it might be harder to find Muslim and Dalit respondents. So maybe I'll get 10% Dalits and 10% Muslims and 80% of everyone else. Now unless I'm very careful in reweighting, two things. Number one, I may not know the actual percentages of the actual communities in each one of these constituencies. And number two, my actual representativeness might be way off. So that is what's going to mess up my prediction at the seat level. Now if that carries through the survey, you'll end up getting very big biases. On the other hand, the fact that you've gone to every seat gives you some understanding of exactly what is happening in every seat. The other method that Rahul talked about, which is when you pick a set of representative constituencies, typically those agencies, CSDS being the most sort of prominent of them, low PT, uh, they're very careful to make sure that the numbers that they're getting are very close to census-wise estimates. So it is genuinely a representative sample. But the challenge there is that once you have a representative sample of a few constituencies, how do you then predict the number of seats at the state level and then at a national level? So they're using formulas based on historical trends and just sort of other our other understanding of arithmetic. And there the seat-wise estimates can go off. So both of these have their strengths and weaknesses. 
So I know we moved away from the original question of how to interpret the, the, the polls and we'll come back to that, but I think this is very important in order to be able to uh, enable us to, to get a better sense. Neelan, since you know, you've been looking at uh, uh, polls uh, and, and uh, you also, I think, have a sense of how this works in other parts of the world, could you give us some comparators? both in terms of, I, I suspect similar challenges exist in the process of polling in the US or, uh, or in other places. And of course, infamously now we are being reminded again and again that Australia got it all wrong and so we shouldn't believe exit polls. I think we've been reminded that of that more when it's uh, convenient to be reminded of that more than any deeper understanding of the Australian exit polls. But do give us a comparative sense. Um, and the second question that I had for you was, you know, one of the things we discovered in this conversation uh, yesterday night, Access Poll, I think you were on the show, was talking about how it went about asking its question. And it seems very clear that they were asking whether you supported a political party, not whether you voted a political, for a political party. Now, I was surprised by that, uh, perhaps because I don't know how exit polls take place, but my understanding of what it takes to run a survey is that you have to have a very specific question, especially if you're doing it in these lightning strike surveys at this this pace and scale. So, and, and aren't supported and voted possibly to slightly different things. So, so can you tell us a little bit about the question? Um, and what that may do to shift answers if it does at all. Okay, so the first part of your question is sort of comparative aspect. So first thing, uh, just I'll put it right out there, this is an ex objective fact. Our exit polling in India is significantly worse than the quality of polling in any of the countries that you've mentioned, whether it be the UK, the US, and Australia. When these people, when we are saying the polls went off in these other countries, first of all, we're usually not talking about exit polls. We're talking about pre polls. Here, pre polls are not even in the game, right? Second, uh, we're talking about situations where even in Australia, the miss was by about two percentage points, yeah. Yeah. right? Uh, so these are not situations. We're talking about elections in which the margins were significantly closer, yeah. and the biases there were biases in polls, but there were only a small number of percentage points. You can just look at the kind of numbers that Rahul was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. The kinds of seat share uh, variances and vote share variances we're seeing across exit polls. That's not something you see in the West, right? Mm -hmm. If you go off, you go off systematically by a small number of percentage points, but nothing like what we're seeing here. Nothing like the kinds of reversals that we've seen in recent times, even as recently as an election in Chhattisgarh, where people missed by uh, double digits on the, uh, you know, Vote share percentages and seat shares, right? So, um, so, so I think that we're talking about a completely different universe. But uh, sorry, is it because we don't have transparency norms that you can do all of these surveys without telling people what your methodology is, what your uh, 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 what, what what statistical methods you're using to convert? And so, so are, are there best practices that we could? Uh, there, there are best practices. I will say that CSDS Lokniti is probably the only genuinely transparent agency, and that's because they don't have any other money to make from it. They're not a marketing agency. They don't have they don't have anything else to sell. But so they you, they actually have uh, explicit methodological notes. It's not something you see from other agencies. So we don't know how rigorous uh, most of these methods are. But even brief conversations with most of these agencies demonstrate that a certain level of statistical rigor is not present in the vast majority of these exit polls. And your first clue is that there are no 95% confidence intervals, there are no margins of error, right? You know, things that you would Basically, learn in the first four or five weeks of a stats class are not reported in, in, in these polls, so that's your first clue that something is a bit off. Um, so I agree that uh, you know, there's a certain level of statistical rigor that is, is, is simply not being reported. Um, the second thing is that what is happening in much of the West when we aggregate polls, we have a little more information. We have sample sizes, but we're given some amount of data. So when we think about what Nate Silver does in the US, he's actually aggregating across polls in a particularly sophisticated way based on the information that is available and the quality of the polls themselves. We can't even conceive of doing that here, right? So there's wide variation in the polls. There's lack of transparency in how they're being conducted. And we have no way of genuinely aggregating or averaging or weighting across polls. The other bias that comes in, which is completely non-scientific, and this is just sort of some of the, the, the innards of, 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 of uh, estimating fuel. Typically, the raw data is off by quite a bit. 
So I can go to a particular constituency and because of biases, and I know that my data is biased, I see that 80% of the constituency says it's going to vote for BJP. Now, 80% of no constituency votes for BJP. Yeah. Now, what I end up having to do as a poll voter is ad hoc, I have to come and, and put some weights on this number to come up with reasonable estimates, and different poll voters come up with different weights. And that is a completely non scientific process. So, part of the reason why you end up getting very, very different vote shares across is that there are different adjustment mechanisms that these posters are using and that is completely non-transparent and typically completely non-scientific. Right? I, I just wanted to add a couple of things of what Neil said. Uh, it's not that people are, I, I assume that it's not that people are reporting very different things to these posters which is producing this wide variation. It is basically usage of very different adjusting techniques which is uh, producing this difference. In fact, like ABP Nielsen, which is giving the lowest uh, vote share, uh, sheet share, uh, we heard on the television uh, that uh, Nielsen weighted the current vote share by the recall. Uh, now, this is, this is a method some people use, but it is certainly going to bring the vote shares down. down. Uh, similarly, and, and this is all now because as we will said, like there is no transparency, so even if you have to fix the problem, we have to know the receipts, right? We don't even know what the problem is. It seems that many of the pollsters who have got the ranges in 350s and who shares 45% plus for the NDA have not adjusted for very, very minor parties. So surveys, like in surveys across the world, very minor parties which are around 1 or 2 or 3 percent will get underreported. Uh, this is not manipulation, but just by like the nature of survey research. So what you do is historically try to scale them up a little bit. What Lieber mentioned, that everyone does this ad hoc. There is no sort of like base vote for everyone. If, if they follow the same method, we might get more conversions than this wide variation. Uh, the second point which you were discussing about the best practices, so in UK, in US you have like a sort of a regulatory, not regulatory body, but there is an agency where all pollsters are registered, there are be best practices guidelines, everyone follows at least minimal uh, guidelines. We don't have anything like that in India. You have, it seems like many polling agencies are like fly-by-night operators, they come and go with every uh, election season. The third problem, and uh, you mentioned Australia, do you even know that? Mm -hmm. like, the, so pollsters in India and elsewhere also, when you have like close elections, the chances of you being off is high because you, you're basically within the margin of error, right? And, and, and so, so that kind of thing happens even here. But what we are seeing, the problem is that even if the direction is same and you are sort of predicting a landslide for one particular party or alliance, even after that you give such a wide range, which is, which is, then, then there's no point of doing this big surveys if, if you That's right. have to get this kind of range, right? Yeah. Like yeah. After five likes, seven like responding, the convergence should be in such a range that yeah. it makes like some sense. I mean to underscore the point here, I mean just very quickly. If the standard we're using is just to get the trend right, I'm not sure that anybody, including people who are quite biased against the ruling government, didn't think the BJP would be the single largest party and the NDA was going to be the single largest coalition. If that was all that was needed to be really need all these exit polls. in the first yeah. place. So, quite right. so, I mean, if that's the metric by which we're judging these, that's a very bad sign, right? We should yeah. be doing a lot better than that. Yeah. I just want to quickly go back to the second part of your question about support versus yeah. vote yeah. and uh, pick up on something that Rahul said which picks up exactly what the issue with asking one question versus the other is. When I am in a particular constituency, there are local factors, there are independent candidates that I support because they are my friends and so on and so forth. So in every constituency, you will see, yes, the vast majority of the vote share is going to the parties we think, Congress, BJP, BS, PSP, whatever. But some percentage of the vote share, sometimes as much as 10, 15 percentage points in a constituency is going to some independent set of candidates, nota, whatever, right? Now, I may support the BJP, but choose to vote for a local candidate in one of these places because of my personal ties to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, this 
question of underestimating local parties, independent candidates, small parties, and the difference between vote and support are very, very directly related, right? You will typically, on a question like support, get much, much higher response for the much larger, more right. well-known parties, right. and not the small candidate. For if I am actually voting for an independent candidate, which party do you support? Yeah, you won't have an answer to that question. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, there is a genuine difference. Or if you do no doubt, right? So I don't support anyone. Is that option available to you as well? Right. So that is a genuine difference between the two questions. That doesn't mean that you won't get the trend right or that, you know, three, four, five percentage points. If you get enough difference in support for the BJP versus the Congress, that, it, that broadly the differences will, will even out. Where these kinds of polls though can go very wrong is that once the margin drops below five to seven percentage points in what you're estimating in a constituency, these local factors are going to matter a lot. And, and yeah. you can get a lot of the predictions. Yeah. Right? And, and yeah. just add to what you're saying. So one is the wording, right? Which is support or vote. And on top of that, people use very different techniques to ask this question. So there are posters who are going to ask Yavri, who did you vote for? Orally, and you have to answer that. Others supply you a dummy ballot paper, dummy ballot boxes. Others supply you a tablet which has a replica of an EVM, right? To ensure confidentiality. Now, think of like the interaction of these two variables. Yeah, it's completely different. So, so you yeah, are yeah. going to get a very, yeah. very different. Yeah, result. no, I mean, as, as somebody who does surveys on a regular basis, the things that you think about, right? Where do you ask the question? Because it might be the same question if I ask a question in the classroom. So say I want to find out about uh, how it, uh, what a child's learning ability is. If I test a child in a school versus when I test a child in the home, it's likely that I will get two very different responses. If I test a child in the village square, where lots of people are watching, I may get a completely different response, right? So where do you do it? How you ask the question? Yes. Uh, in what context are you asking the question? All of these things seem to matter, which is why I wonder then, when we do poll of polls, right, and it's 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 the kind of thing that as a viewer or a consumer of this information, I get very excited about. I clear up my evening on Sunday, made sure that I was in front of the television at the right time and was waiting to see the poll of the polls. But in a sense, we're comparing apples with oranges without even knowing what the apples yeah. are and what the oranges are. But that's why the Nate Silver method is important. Yeah. That's why transparency in method, transparency in the quality of the survey, transparency in you know. Sample sizes at various constituency levels is very, very important because that's the only kind of information that can allow us to have a more sophisticated model of averaging and, and weighting and aggregating across surveys. But Rahul, despite all these flaws, uh, I think you made two very important points uh, in your piece today and you, you've been making this argument for the last few days. There are things that we get from polls yeah. uh, and even in this very, very... Uh, uh, sort of limited fashion in which we conduct polls in India, they still are contributing to a deeper understanding of what's actually going on. Tell us a little bit about that. Secondly, you had a very interesting chart today. Yeah. Uh, and in that chart, you seem to suggest that despite all these flaws and all these limitations, we don't get it as badly as yeah. we could. We, you yeah, know, yeah. Common sense would take you, right? Yeah. Once, you, once you have this conversation. So tell us a little bit about that. So I think both Leland and I agree and Leland pointed this out is, is basically about close elections, right? Exit, so exit polls in India do very badly when it's a close election. But when the direction, so they get the, generally they get the direction right. Uh, they also get the sort of like very close to the sheets share most of it. But the problem, the second question which you asked, like they are useful, but they become only useful when they supply some kind of data which social science researchers like us can use and figure out the trends. But many of these polls are just like for election night forecasting, nothing more. So then that's the sad part of election polling. Across the world, election polling both helps in methodological innovation because there is like uh, research money at stake in it, but also helps us in deciphering the broader social and political trends that are going uh, in that country. So on that front, India is doing like really bad. Uh, uh, <laughs> but, but, but at least like if, if you just care about whether exit polls can tell us the direction of who's going to win, I think they're doing fine on that front. 
the point I made, this point I made in a context, and the context is is basically we build up theories without having like lots of information. So we, so so there are two reasons. One, I think like if you read use, so so big question about the selection is why are exit polls odds with the news reports or the field reports? Quite right. Yeah. Uh, in most parts of the world, there is sort of like an agreed division of labor. People don't argue with pollsters who have to make prediction, and people who go on the field report about the deep churning that is going on in the society. In India, there is no such distinction. Even reporters who visit one constituency or don't even come step outside, the, uh, they, they, everyone tries to come up with an estimate. Philip Oldin worked wrote a very interesting yes. paper in 1984, Pollsters and Pundits. And he basically talks about a trioka of three kinds of people. Mm -hmm. People who think they are knowledgeable, uh, in connection with journalists, in connection with some local politician, produce some kind of estimates in their head, and those estimates sort of circulate. Right? Neil and I know a lot of people, and everybody's prediction was 220. And you know, and, and then you start doubting where this, the number two twenty comes from because it seems like everyone is talking to each other and just reinforcing their view. Yeah, so, so where we are lacking is the, these polls are, would have made much more sense if we were getting good ground level reports of what is happening, what kind of benefits people are getting from the government or not getting, uh, how are they talking about the incumbent and the opposition. Uh, so, so, so that was the first context. Second one is this mythological theory of silent voters. Yes. So there, there are silent voters, but silent voters are of wide variety, right? There are silent, like uh, we have this term in American voting literature of Bradley effect, which is basically whites saying in polls that they will vote for a non-white candidate, but they won't end up voting. Social desirability bias. You have shy Tories and shy conservatives in UK. Similarly, polls have consistently shown that 8 to 10 percent of Muslims or 20 percent of Dalits, at least in the last four or five elections, have been voting for the BJP. Now, if you go to the field, it is very unlikely that you meet a Muslim or a Dalit who would say, I will vote for BJP. Right? So they are also silent voters uh, yeah. in that sense. Right? Yeah. And, and then there are silent voters who actually haven't made up, like we know, at least one fourth of voters made up make up their mind in the last 48 hours or when they stand in the queue. So they, they actually don't know. So there is no strategic silence they are maintaining to field reporters and, 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 and pollsters. It's just they don't know. They they stand in the line for them, perhaps just talk to some friends and neighbors in the line and then decide, okay, you are also voting for that party, I will also vote. This is a bit like peer pressure effect. So so in that context I was trying to say that polls are not that bad. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have to trust anything or like uh, if you have to make your judgment about who's going to win on 23rd, rely more on polls than newsroom gossips and, sure. and those kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. No, that's that's absolutely true. Well, thank you. I think this has been very enlightening because uh, it's, it's given us a much deeper sense of, of what this whole process is all about. Um, and with 24-7 media, this process really does tend to dominate. Uh, but let's take this process and place it in the context of the present election. Uh, we, uh, I think some of my initial question about the variation we're seeing in West Bengal, Orissa, Uttar Pradesh, I think you've sort of covered because it gives us a sense you're probably getting this variation because of the way in which the polls have been conducted. Uh, but, uh, you know, we are also doing exit polls in the context of a very long and phased election. Right, uh, and not to make a mistake of the uh, of the journalists that you just described, but if you want to pick up all the gossip from the political parties over the last month and a half, they've got to, they've been doing their exit polls right after each phase, and presumably that means that the polls themselves, even though they're not out in the public domain, uh, there's been leak polls. Uh, you can see changes in strategy along the way uh, in the election. Uh, so how should you know? How do you? look at the, the whole process of the exit polls in the current conversation uh, or the current context of Indian elections themselves, just how they are conducted and what their implications are. Um, and let's not forget that uh, for, for all of those who are like me, who spend all their time oscillating between the television screen and WhatsApp over the last two days, you're also getting a lot of conspiracy theories that are merged in. Uh, so, uh, you know, can you give us some sense of, uh, is this normal? 
you know, is this part and parcel of what you can expect of the drama of elections? In any case, all will be clear uh, two days from now. Or is this something that we as citizens uh, need to be wary about uh, in terms of how we do exit polling in the context of long phase elections? So, uh, you know, it's a difficult question. Uh, you know, what I would say is that we have a certain bias that has come, it's creeped in from the West, right? And it's a certain extraordinary belief in the kinds of numbers that we should have to be able to put to voters in a world in which it's much harder to get those numbers, mm -hmm. right? So let me just take us for a second to some of the murkiness here. Many of the pollsters you are seeing who are doing polls on television for the major channels also have political parties as clients. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. They're technically running different polls for them. But which we don't know in the public domain. Which we don't know in the public domain. Now, this is also something the citizen or the voter knows that the person coming to my door may not be just a pollster. He may actually look like he's from the same agency, but at the same time he's collecting data for a political party and a news agency. We just simply don't know. There's yeah. very little transparency. Now, several things happen for the voter at that point. The voter can choose not to respond, even if he or she has already made a decision. That's what's called non-response bias. Or maybe I am a Congress voter, and I live in a BJP dominated area, and uh, I don't want to get beaten up. I don't know who you are. I'll just simply say I'm voting for BJP. Mm -hmm. So I may lie. And that is something that is we are we fear is far more prevalent in a place like India as compared to somewhere in the West, where people just simply won't respond. Lying is less common, mm -hmm. right? So these are problems that we have. So this, while the science of polling may have gotten better on some levels, there are certain fundamental truths about society and social behavior mm -hmm. that simply going to somebody's door and the and and the very sort of organization we have of polling in India will not solve. At some point, a pollster is going to have to make a decision about how many people who are voting for the Congress or the BJP or a regional party are not responding to me, how many of them are lying to me, and how do I make those corrections, right? And that is going to cause a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for us to somehow believe that these are very precise estimates mm -hmm. in a world that is this complicated is actually the, the basis of the problem. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And I absolutely like, non-response bias and lying are two big factors which sort of like spoils your survey design. Now, it's not that statisticians have not thought about such problems. There are ways that, like, if Leela or I or like people who are trained like us get access to data, we can detect these problems and also, to an extent, fix it. Right. Uh, but unless we have that kind of transfer, unless pollsters tell you that we approach 30,000 voters, 20,000 responded, 10,000 didn't respond. This is the sample profile of those who didn't respond. This is the sample. So unless we get that kind of methodological transparency, it is hard to sort of like fix that kind of problem. Even for lying also, then you can create certain questions or indicators which will not completely erase it, but at least you can reduce the effect of these things. So what we are saying that polling as a science or, or at least uh, as a discipline, is far more advanced in other parts of the world than in India. Mm -hmm. Second, I think the question which you asked about like the whole context in which election is happening, so generally political parties across the world have their own sure, pollsters and they try to get information what is happening. Uh, the problem here is like, uh, we, so, there are pollsters who are aligned with political parties, which in other parts of the world is known that Fox Television is going to poll or have bias for Republicans, and uh, CNBC will show some kind of bias. In India, the problem is accentuated because they know, but we don't know. Yeah. Right? So we don't know uh, which They know, which... we know, but we can't say. By the way, just a quick comment on the thing. Every exit poll being run in India right now is illegal. So this is like one of these very strange things. No, no, uh, wait, why? So, Technically, you can only run a poll after the last vote has been cast. In other words, you should not be collecting vote behavior after every phase. And you should certainly not be able to declare it at 6 p.m. Yeah. because there's re-polling that's still available. Yeah, 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 yeah. So actually, if the ECI wanted to, 
it could declare all of these exit polls illegal. Mm -hmm. Right. I see. Uh, so that is uh, so it's not that there isn't a law. It's just simply that the law is strategically not being adhered to. And, and so, so the second uh, issue might be in that, in that context that where you have like designated pollsters or pollsters who are aligned with political parties. What is more problematic in, in the Indian case that ruling party generally likes to sort of have control over many pollsters than compared to people who are in opposition. Right, right. So, so, so incumbents have more information advantage than anyone else right. in that. Right, right. Well, I mean, I think that. Uh, particularly in today's context where there's now a whole new set of questions that are being raised about uh, the objective arbiter of the election, say, uh, the election commission. Um, these rumors and conspiracy theories are sort of adding to uh, questions that are, I think, are placing doubts on exit polls or certainly raising questions about the ability of political parties to misuse it. Uh, yeah, exit polls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and does that have long-term implications on the art of polling? Indeed, like uh, if, if, if pollsters are going to be aligned with political parties and serving their interest only, then they don't care that much about the science of polling as a method to understand social political behavior. Mm -hmm. Even if they might like, even if they're interested, that interest is to serve only political mm -hmm. parties, but not yeah. putting that kind of information in, yeah. in public domain. So, yeah. so that's yeah. that's bad for social science research for sure, and bad for democracy because then information is restricted for one kind, one group, not everybody. Neelan, is this unique to India, or you know, every time uh, questions and debates are had on uh, the nature of democracy in India? Uh, you'll always hear some people going, but it's a global trend. Uh, so are these kinds of, sort of the, the possible blurring of boundaries even between uh, what are seen as objective processes in elections uh, with, uh, it, uh, uh, with politics uh, a characteristic or possible characteristic in, what's in the shift that other democracies across the world are having? Or are uh, we setting a trend here? This is, this is unique. <laughs> I, I think... I think um, Certainly, the lack of sheer lack of transparency and, and, and uh, attention to statistical rigor is unique to India. But also, this sort of fungibility across party and media agency when one when when an agency is polling and exactly how samples are being treated across party and agency that I think is typically and I know the U.S. case the best. Uh, Parties have their internal polling units mm. that are completely explicitly run under the party. They hire consulting firms, which are separate consulting firms, but those are then dedicated to the political party. They're certainly not then separately running a poll and then giving it to uh, you know giving it to an agency. They do at times there are Republican-oriented pollsters and Democratic party oriented cultures, but they're very clearly labeled. Right, right. Then Leland pointed out a very interesting thing, which is basically when the pollster or the field investigator goes on the ground, the respondent doesn't know who this question is being asked for. And just think like rationally, if you are a pollster, you want to save money, right? Absolutely. Why would you send your field investigator twice yeah. for one survey you are doing and for client A, client B? You might have totally. five clients totally. and you would do that survey totally. once, right? Absolutely. So, and, Absolutely. And, and, and then perhaps those field investigators might have also, they, they, they know that who's, who are our client, right? Yeah. And they, they just to sometimes boost the confidence of your client, you, you, you might be yeah. doing some kind of things on the ground yeah. which is not desirable in a social scientific poll. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think I mean I think an important takeaway that uh, is shockingly actually not part of the public debate uh, is uh, this issue of how do we ensure that we have a strong regulatory body and a strong set of transparency norms around the process of polling, especially if, uh, as is the case today, 
that exit polls are allowing for casting doubt over the entire election process. I mean, if you take the exit poll numbers combined with this kind of questioning that is taking place of the EVMs, the questions that are being asked of the election commission, and the kind of conspiracy theories that's uh, sort of yielding uh, for exit polls to be completely transparent about their methods, about their processes, about their political party affiliations, is probably even more important in India today uh, than ever before. I cannot let both of you go without asking the obvious question. Neelan, what happens on Thursday? What's your number? I have no answer. <laughs> um, but, uh, nice try though. <laughs> uh, 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 what I will say is this, just thinking a little bit about the polls, uh, I think one's best guess should be somewhere within the range of the polls because uh, as we said, that for all of the flaws, it's still a, a more rigorous method than talking to a few people in a few constituencies and trying to aggregate across the country. Right. So let me just talk a little bit about how the polls might go wrong. Mm -hmm. So right now, if one were to give a number based on the exit polls, I would just take the median and say that's my best guess. Right. It doesn't mean much of anything. So there are a few states in which there's significant variation, right? And we've talked about them, Uttar Pradesh, West Bengal, Orissa, right? So if the BJP does not do as well as it is hoping in these states, you will see a significantly lower tally for the BJP and the NPO. But there's a second source of variation that we haven't talked enough about, right? So one is just the variation of the polls are finding, and the second is, is there a systematic bias in where the polls, what the polls are estimating? So right now, if we are to look at the data, there were six states in which the BJP won 70% of its seats. Mm -hmm. Those were Bihar, UP, MP, Rajasthan, uh, Gujarat, and Maharashtra. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were to look at it, UP is the only state in which pollsters are finding the BJP has come down somewhat. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in the rest of these states, where the BJP had more than a 90% strike rate, the BJP is being predicted by every exit poll to sweep once again. Right? Right. Now, if there's a systematic bias in how these pollsters are measuring these states, then the BGP can only come down. So if the exit polls we find have missed and they have overestimated the BGP, my instinct is where we're going to find it is that they have systematically bi found a bias or systematically biased towards the BGP in these four BGP states. And in fact, the Congress has made some more ground. Now we have no evidence for that. That right. is the silent voters so of the speak. Right. Right. But if, if the exit polls are off, that's where it is. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll basically cut the with Nina. We both like to avoid giving numbers because uh, we know that's not what one like can do. We haven't run any polls. Uh, but if, if you just have to sort of like my guess would be somewhere around the median. I think uh, the polls who have given very high seat estimate as well as vote estimate, they are sort of overestimating both the seat and uh, vote thing. Just to paraphrase and add a bit what Neelan was saying, see, there is wide variation at the state level among right. polls, right? What can happen is that those variations, so even if there are changes, in a national election what generally happens is that those variations cancel each other out and you Correct. get the net result. Correct. But what can also happen that those errors basically accumulate in one direction and can produce both effect, right? So you could actually end up getting a 2004-like situation where they accumulate against the BJP mm -hmm. and, and basically numbers come very down mm -hmm. or they accumulate in favor of BJP and, and they go like very hot as well. So yeah. both could happen. But basically, like if people remember our last election at the where you and I had a conversation, election always happen in a context, Absolutely. right? So you just like take a cup of coffee or chai or whatever drink you like and sit and think what was the context in which 2019 election was happening? What was the base of all political parties? Based in a sense, what was the electoral strength when they went to polls? What was happening during the polls? So given the kind of numbers we saw in 2014, for something to get overturned, yeah. So the, the campaign should have produced some kind of uh, hints, uh, which was visible in 2014 campaign, sure. right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah. if, if you so so if you haven't got those hints, the base effect is likely to play out, and and I think there's no guesses that BJP is likely to have an advantageous position Absolutely. in that sense. Absolutely. 
So advantage BJP, but there's still suspense despite the exit polls for what happens on Thursday. We will come back to you with a debrief, uh, understanding what the verdict looks like uh, over the weekend. Uh, and on the 27th of May, we'll have a much uh, larger session uh, that will debate the election verdict and engage with what this means for the future of Indian politics. Watch this space. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Neelan. Thank, Thank you, Rahul.